Hello, hope you're all well. So, you've had a chance to make some predictions. Let's see if any of you were correct. Let's see if they found anything on there at all. So, chapter 18, the ninth theory. When we got home, there was a smog in the living room caused by Aunt Gloria's cigarettes. A smog is technically a mixture of smoke, fog and chemical fumes, but this was a mixture of smoke, smoke and more smoke. Mum said there had been no news, but we already knew this because Dad's mobile phone had not rung. I tried to tell her and Aunt Gloria about our trip to the London Eye, but Kat started coughing and Dad said we had had a very pleasant walk by the river. Then Kat gave Aunt Gloria the bath oil, saying it was a present from both her and me. When Aunt Gloria looked at the label, her lips went up. She said, thank you, Kat, and thank you, Ted, and added that it was the kind she'd used when Salim was little. The little devil that he was, she said, forever pinching it. He likes the bubbles, blowing them up, giggling when they burst. Then she started crying, and Mum told Kat and me to go upstairs. Upstairs, Kat got out the wallet of photos and flipped through them at a rate of one a second. I was very excited to see them, but she wouldn't let me. In 18 sec seconds, 18 pictures of our back garden and the washing line in the shed were all over my duvet. When she got back to the first 18 shots, the ones taken the morning of Salim's disappearance, she slowed down. I tried to look over her shoulder, but she jerked away. She went through them twice and dropped them in the bed as if she was no longer interested. I picked them up and looked. Just a set of stupid touristy shots, Kat said, like any others. There were scenes of the Houses of Parliament, Lambeth Bridge and the Eye from different angles. The best shot was one Salim had taken of Cat and me on the Jubilee footbridge. Had Cat's face and mine close together, and behind us was half of the eye, and some bridge and river and sky. Cat was smiling. My head was off to one side, and my eyes were looking upwards as if I was thinking. Cat was taller than me. My head ended where her chin began. The last shot was one I had taken. It had gone wrong. Instead of the London eye, I had snapped some legs and headless bodies of the people near where we'd been queuing. I arranged the photos on my desk alongside the souvenir shot of the capsule in which we thought Salim had been a passenger, and the list of theories. We sat in silence. Cat breathed out long and hard. I don't even know what I expected to find, she said, shuffling the pictures about. I wish we'd just given Aunt Glow Salim's camera when we found, first found it. Now we'll have to explain why we didn't give it to her. And I bet when she sees Salim's last photos, she'll just start crying again. She picked up the shot of her and me on the footbridge and threw it down again. A clue? As if. I picked up the photo. Let's keep the photos and camera safe in my room until Salim returns, I suggested. If he returns, Jack said, biting her lip. She shook her head and swept all the photos into a rough pile. But I agree. There's no point upsetting Aunt Glow. You don't have to lie, Ted. Just say nothing. Then Cat picked up the list of theories. As for this, she scrunched it up and threw it in the waste paper basket. It's beyond us, Ted. I watched the paper crackle softly as if it was trying to reopen itself. When the corners reappeared, I took it back off the rubbish and smoothed it flat on the desk. Forget it, Ted, Cat said. I picked up a pen. Let's try a process of elimination, I said. The world's most famous fictional detective, Sherlock Holmes, says that once you've eliminated all the possibilities, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. I was eager to see if we could eliminate all of the theories except for my favourite theory of all which was that Salim had spontaneously combusted. This would not have been a good outcome for Aunt Gloria, or for Salim, but it would mean that spontaneous combustion was a real phenomenon, and discovering this would have been an advance in science. Theories 1 and 8 can go, I began. Today we've proved that Salim couldn't have stayed in his capture after it came down, and he couldn't have come out hiding under somebody else's clothes. I crossed them out. Drop it, Ted. I leave 6. While you're at it, you can cross off the one about spontaneous explosion or whatever it's called. Theory number five. Yeah, and the time warp one. Number seven. My pencil hovered over the list. But supposing we eliminate all of the others and... Oh, grow up, Ted. I wish Cat would spontaneously combust there and then, but she didn't. Her eyebrows brows came close together and her lips went right down. Then a tear came rolling out of her left eye and down her nose. I thought of something I hadn't thought of before. Very slowly, I drew a wavy line through theories five and seven, even though a strange feeling went up my esophagus. Done, I said. Cat picked up the list as if she were interested again. She brushed off the tear. That leaves four theories, she said. Two, three, four, and six. And nine, I said, remembering. Nine? 
The ninth theory is the one I was going to tell you about last night, I reminded her. When the phone rang, you never wrote it down. She took the pen from me. You never told me what it was. Out with it, Ted. It better be good. It is. I started dictating. The ninth theory is that Salim never got on the eye in the first place. Kat got halfway through writing the words, then stopped and said it was daft. And I said it wasn't, and she ha hadn't seen him get on. And she said, hadn't we seen him get on? And I said, we had seen what we thought was Salim, but it was just a shadow and could have been anyone. He turned and waved, Kat said. Lots of people might have done that. Not just Salim. But what happened to Salim then, between when we said goodbye and when he got to the top of the ramp? I would not considered this. He might have stopped to do his trainers and decided not going on after all and come back down the ramp after we moved away. And then he might have looked for us, but we'd vanished into the crowds. And then he might have got lost or run away or got kidnapped. Cat closed her eyes. Okay, Ted. I'm reliving the moment. I shut my eyes too, but all I could see was the wrong way round Z and the line of boys, all Salim's lookalikes, smiling and waving and saying goodbye and walking to the edge of a precipice. Ted. Kat said, I opened my eyes. I have to admit, it's a clever theory. A good tingling feeling went up my esophagus, up to my scalp. I smiled. But it's wrong, Ted. I stopped smiling. Wrong? I don't expect you to understand. The boy who waved from the top of the ramp, the way he stood and looked back, then the way he turned and walked on. It was Salim. I just know. You just know? It's a body language thing. The good feeling I had turned bad. Body language is a form of communication, like speaking, e speaking English or French or Chinese, but it has no words, only gestures. Humans and chimpanzees and meerkats and stingrays can read body language by instinct without having to learn it. But according to the doctors who diagnose me, people with my kind of syndrome can't. We have to learn it like a foreign language, and this takes time. You mean you saw something about the boy who waved that I didn't? Yes, Ted. Cat's voice was soft. She put a hand on my shoulder, which made the hairs on my neck stick up. Trust me, it was Salim we saw. It just was. I took the pencil back from Cat and crossed off what she'd written for Theory 9. I crossed it out three times over. I thought it the best theory of all until then. Now it was almost dead. Almost at birth. Dead as a dodo, you could say. Okay, so have a think about that. Do you think that Theory 9 is an option? Or do you agree with Kat that that couldn't be? Or is there a reason why Kat might have thought that?